major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. And by viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening. It's Tuesday, March 29th. Thank you for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. In about an hour, the present and the future plans of San Diego County will be laid out for all to hear. Board of Supervisors Chairman Nathan Fletcher set to give his second State of the County speech. And KPBS reporter John Carroll is live in Mountain View with a look at the key topics Fletcher is likely to talk about tonight. John. Maya, this is the second time Chair Fletcher has delivered the State of the County. Last year it was a virtual event, but this year it is in person. However, limited attendance because it is invite only here at the San Diego Continuing Educational Center. Now, Chair Fletcher did release a video last week touching on some of the subjects he intends to cover. An email from him a couple of hours ago says he'll talk about new opportunities for sheltering the unsheltered, new initiatives to tackle the opioid crisis, a new initiative to tackle child care workforce and facility shortages and more. Joining me for more on that last subject is Jason Pagio from the Asian American Business Association of San Diego. Jason, so, thank you so much for being out here. Um, I know that you have had a chance to get a look at some of what he's going to talk about in the in the realm of child care and stuff. What can you tell us about that? Well, in the short briefing I had in terms of the speech today, we're going to be looking at not just where San Diego County is today, but where we're going. And in terms of the investments that the chair is looking to make, um, as you mentioned, uh, some of those top priorities in terms of how we build up our workforce, a lot of it will be related to child care, it will be related to mental health, uh, and, uh, and looking at how we could hire a lot of our veterans going forward. And then uh, you got another uh, look at something, a little preview, right? Tell me about that. Uh, which part? Oh, I thought... <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, I thought you told me about some other uh, subject that you were uh, briefed on. But if uh, I'm wrong about that, oh, no, that's well, okay. I, I got a, a very short blip, but it's, it's a lot of real talk about um, sort of the reality of the county. But how do we make these concerted investments in uh, communities who are underserved and under-resourced? But, you know, as you mentioned with child care, it's something that's top of mind, not just for a lot of employers and families, but a lot of our small businesses who need to make sure that we have child care in place so that a lot of our small businesses can survive. Right. They can't unless the kids have someone to take care of them. Yep. Jason, thank you so much. So, uh, Maya, this speech will begin at 6.10 this evening. We will be live streaming it on our Facebook and YouTube channels, as well as the KPBS homepage, which, as I'm sure you know, is kpbs.org. And we'll have more on what Chair Fletcher says on tomorrow's morning edition, and then after that on this very broadcast tomorrow night. Live in Mountain View, John Carroll, KPBS News. Despite the recent rainstorm, much of California remains under severe or extreme drought. Governor Gavin Newsom has issued an executive order requiring urban water agencies to go into level two drought restrictions. KPBS reporter Alexander Nguyen shows us what it means for San Diego. San Diego has been under level one for water conservation. At level two, local water agencies can reduce the number of days people could water their lawns, among other things. The order came as California recorded its driest first three months in the state's history. December through March is typically the rainy season in the state. The recent rainstorm was not a drought buster. According to the latest U.S. Drought Monitor report, most of California is under severe or extreme drought. However, the San Diego region fares a bit better at moderate drought. Still, Newsom's order could mean more water restrictions. Level two typically means up to a 20% reduction in water use is what you're targeting. But there's lots of details that have to be worked out over the next two months. The governor's order issued Monday calls for water agencies to resume a water scarcity of 20% and to come up with a plan to cut water use. As a region, San Diego has been good at this, says Jeff Stevenson with the Water Authority. Compared to the state overall, San Diego has been a leader in water use efficiency and conservation over the years and continues to be. Newsom's order also asked the state water board to ban watering grass that is strictly ornamental, such as grass on street medians. 
As for agricultural use, farmers are not subject to these restrictions, says Tom Kennedy with the Rainbow Municipal Water District. The, uh, the legislature and the governor wants to make sure people can still get food grown and things like that. So it's important that those functions maintain. The state water board has until May 25th to consider the actions Newsom outlined. Alexander Wen, KPPS News. And one group of Californians is being hit hard by the drought, our farmers. Coming up, a look at the no-win choices that they're making and the price we're all paying as a result. A second COVID booster dose is officially being recommended for older adults and the immunocompromised. The CDC says adults over 50 can get the additional booster shot four months after their previous one. Federal health officials say the second boost is especially important for those over 65 and those with underlying conditions. For the general public who's gotten their two shot series and then a booster, it's not really clear that a, another booster would really uh, offer too much additional protection. And that's why FDA didn't really make this as a blanket recommendation. It's really targeted on older individuals as well as those that are immunocompromised. The CDC's recommendations come after the FDA earlier today gave authorization for second boosters. The FDA reports they are safe and data shows they increase protection for those who are high risk. COVID vaccines will be offered to migrants in custody at the southern border. That's according to the Department of Homeland Security. This plan may also be extended to thousands of people who are found trying to get into the U.S. The DHS told Congress that it should be able to provide around 2,700 shots daily, and that number will more than double before the end of May. In 2012, President Barack Obama designated March 29th as Vietnam War Veterans Day. And today, a ceremony to honor those who served in the Vietnam War was held at Miramar National Cemetery. KPBS reporter Kitty Alvarado was there. Oh, say can you see? Veterans and their families gathered at Miramar National Cemetery to commemorate the day set aside to honor their service, March 29th. It's the day in 1973 the last combat troops left Vietnam. We salute all sailors, soldiers, airmen, Marines, Coast Guard veterans. They represent the best of America. The praise, salutes, and honors of the ceremony are a sharp contrast to what some veterans, like Charles Mowry, say they came home to almost 50 years ago. The toughest thing for me, which will never go away, is the unwelcome home. Larry Anderson says he will never forget coming home from Vietnam. I took my uniform and I folded it up in a little ball and I, I just set it on a bench and I put on my civilian clothes so that I wouldn't be yelled at when I go out that door. And uh, that, that struck me the most. I, I, I didn't understand that. And people are still trying to understand everything Vietnam veterans went through, including Bobby Rodriguez. He's named after his father, who was stationed at Camp Pendleton and served in Vietnam. My dad, he would not talk about Vietnam War to us growing up. We, we weren't allowed to talk about it at all. He only recently discovered some letters that his father wrote during the war. His father was part of the 1st Battalion, 9th Marines, known as the Walking Dead, because they suffered the most casualties of any combat troop. As greetings to us. Well, we made it, but we also lost 35% of our battalion. It was really hell. I've never seen so many dead bodies in all of my life. I thought for sure I was a goner. He's a hero. Uh, I have more respect for him now, uh, which I always did have respect for him, but it's a lot more now just knowing what he went through. And uh, after reading these letters, it's a real eye opener. And that's the hope that commemorating this day will open the eyes of those who had no idea what Vietnam veterans went through. So when they see a man in an old cap that says Vietnam, they'll tell them the words they didn't hear nearly five decades ago. Go long overdue. We welcome you home. Kitty Alvarado, KPBS News. 
A California task force on reparations is meeting right now. They're expected to vote on the question of eligibility. Members say they're divided on which black Americans should be eligible for compensation. Some want to limit financial and other compensation to descendants of enslaved people. Others say that all black people in the U.S. suffer from systemic racism in housing, education, and employment. If a vote is reached during this newscast, we will bring you that decision. Congress approved it this month, and now President Biden has signed a bill into law that makes lynching a federal hate crime. The bill, called the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act of 2022, had overwhelming bipartisan support, though it has taken advocates more than a century to pass legislation. Emmett Till was lynched in Mississippi in 1955 by a group of white men. He was only 14 years old. His murder sparked national outrage and was the driving force for the civil rights movement. A controversial federal jail in downtown San Diego was given a last-minute extension to stay open for another 90 days. iNewsource investigative reporter Jill Castellano has the story. Western Region Detention Facility was preparing to shut down on Thursday following Joe Biden's executive order to phase out private prisons. The decision to keep the jail open came unexpectedly late last week. The workers' union for the jail's employees called the last-minute decision a victory. Now they're asking the White House for a long-term solution. Make no mistake, the closure of the wet Western Region Detention Facility would be devastating to the people of San Diego and the surrounding areas. For Katrina Gutierrez, the possible closure has already had devastating consequences. Her husband was transferred out of the jail to Arizona, far away from his family. The facility needs to stay open, not only for the employees, but for the families of the inmates. My husband made a mistake, but my children and I did not. But the ACLU and local activists argue that shutting down Western Region is the right decision. They say Geo Group, the private company running the jail, has created a dangerous environment for detainees. The jail is currently facing three class action lawsuits. For KPBS, I'm my news source investigative reporter, Jill Castellano. And iNewsource is an independently funded nonprofit partner of KPBS. With current protections expiring on Thursday, an assembly bill was designed to help stave off eviction for hundreds of thousands of renters. AB 2179 was approved yesterday, but still needs two-thirds majority from the state Senate to pass. The legislation would protect tenants who have applied for COVID-19 emergency rental assistance through June 30th, as paperwork continues to be processed by the state. As of last week, the state has paid out $2.4 billion to about 214,000 families, but that is is less than half of the households who applied for aid. As the governor calls for water restrictions, farmers in California are struggling as the state's severe drought is putting them in a lose-lose situation. On one hand, they must either use the groundwater they have in storage, where they'll face either quality or quantity issues, or cut back on what they're growing. Reporter Lisa Principe on the price we'll all have to pay. From the north clear down to the south, the lack of water, the lack of snow, the lack of rainfall. Richard Bianchi is the manager of Sabor Farms in Hollister, growing leafy greens like romaine and spinach. But this year, he, along with other farmers in San Benito County, will receive no water from the federally controlled Central Valley Project. We've just had to adjust and, and rely more on those other sources. And for us, it's, uh, it's groundwater. The problem with our groundwater in San Mateo County is the quality isn't as good as our federal water is. Farmers in the county and all across the state are having to factor that lack of water into their crop patterns. There's probably going to be about 25% of the land that normally gets irrigated that's going to end up being fallow. And let's be honest, we're only in March. So, uh, yes, it could, be, it could be that much. It could be considerably more. Jeff Catano is the general manager of the San Benito County Water District. He says last year he made the decision to release all 8,000 acre feet of water the county had stored in local reservoirs for the growers. And crossed our fingers and hoped that something better would come, but it didn't. And it may take two or three years before they're filled back up to where they're, they're in a really healthy position. Now, water issues aren't the only problem hitting California farmers right now. Those fuel prices are being felt as well, and it's all expected to hit the consumer's pocket. Gas, diesel, I mean, everything from fuel being stolen, 
The fuel prices have just gone. I mean, it's what almost doubled from a year ago. Everywhere up the food chain, it's increased costs. So if it doesn't pass to the consumer, I'd be surprised. And it may not just be farmers affected. The San Benito County Water District also delivers water to the city of Hollister, Sunny Slope Water District, and soon San Juan Batista. I am going to get at this point at least some water for my for my urban customers. But the federal government is even looking at pulling that back and making that zero, which has never, ever, ever happened before. So with not much rain forecasted for the rest of this year in California, what is the solution? The only way that we're going to be able to get back to having a healthy groundwater basin and healthy water supplies for, for everybody is to build more storage to capture the water in those wet years. You, you can't conserve your way out of this problem. That was Lisa Principe reporting. Forecasters from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration predict the West's intense multi-year drought to continue and maybe even get worse in the coming months. We're going to be looking at temperatures over the next couple days here in Southern California to kind of stay steady. We're not going to be warming up too much. We're not going to be cooling off too much, but our marine layer is going to remain a persistent force. And so that means a lot of morning cloud covers, some early morning fog, and then those clouds should break for some afternoon sunshine. Temperatures as we head into the overnight period, Tuesday night into Wednesday, get back down into the low 50s in Oceanside. We're looking at upper 40s in Escondido and El Cajon, 55 for you into San Diego for that overnight low. And then Wednesday, we're looking at some slightly warmer air to make a return into the picture. We did have some chill with the clouds and the showers, but that is moving on out. And we'll see a little bit more in the way of sunshine and also a little bit more in the way of warmth. We're looking at temperatures in the mid to upper 60s for you in San Diego. Again, some morning cloud cover should be clearing for some afternoon sunshine. 66 out towards Ramona and into Borrego Springs. We are in the mid 80s, which sounds pretty good right about now. And then Thursday, we're we're going to have to watch just kind of this little piece of energy. It stays lingering here in the four corners and this front along with it stalled out boundary. And so that could mean a little bit of wet weather, perhaps a little bit of added cloud cover on Thursday for some, but nothing major in the forecast here for us on our Thursday. Near the coast, temperature is looking to stay basically in the mid 60s as we look ahead to your extended forecast. A little bit more in the way of cloud cover towards the end of the coming weekend. Further inland, temperatures here mid to upper 60s over the next several days. Again, not warming up a whole lot, not cooling off a whole lot. Just a good amount of morning cloud cover breaking for afternoon sunshine. And then as we head into the mountains, temperatures here, upper 40s, low 50s over the next several days. A mix of sunshine and clouds, a little bit more in the way of sunshine there for you as we head into the start of the weekend. And in the deserts, temperatures looking to stay in the mid to upper 80s over the next five days. For KPBS News, I'm meteorologist Jessica Pash. SDG&E is taking steps to help meet the state's goal of producing 100% carbon-free electricity by 2045. Today, it cut the ribbon on a new energy storage facility in Kearney Mesa. It uses lithium ion phosphate batteries to store carbon-free electricity. SDG&E says the facility can help power 13,000 homes for up to four hours. It allows us to provide energy uh, when supply is short in those hot summer days and we saw that a, a couple of years ago how we needed more resource across the western United States and on the other hand it also provides other benefits such as providing key uh, resiliency needs uh, when there's emergencies uh, or we need to uh, create that type of backup power. The facility is built in a location that used to house combustion generators that were built back in the 1950s. There are more like it in the works across the state and in our region. A drug has recently been made available for immunocompromised San Diegans, but for some, access may be an issue. KPBS health reporter Matt Hoffman spoke with a woman who is anxiously trying to get it. So I have what they call primary immune deficiency. We spoke with a San Diego woman who lives with a compromised immune system. She didn't want to use her name, but says her condition has been with her since she was a kid. I had two surgeries before I was 18 for um, sinus infections that had gotten so bad that they couldn't treat them with antibiotics. I think most of high school I was on preventative antibiotics because I was sick so often. 
Something as simple as a cold can send her to the hospital, and like others who are immunocompromised, she doesn't respond well or at all to vaccines. To counter that, she gets monthly antibody infusions to beef up her immune system. When the pandemic hit, the San Diego resident didn't know what to think. I was terrified. Honestly, I was like, oh gosh, like, because remember the, 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 the H1N1 was the last pandemic and I ended up in the hospital during the pandemic, right? Like seriously ill. And I was like, well, I guess I'm going to die. <laughs> She got good news in December. A new drug called Evusheld is a preventative antibody therapy proven to give the same protection that healthy people get from COVID-19 vaccines. I was so excited. I was, I thought, finally, I can maybe like, like I have nieces and nephews that live across the country and maybe I can go visit them. And, you know, my parents are older and I haven't seen my dad since the pandemic began. Um, and... I would really love to go visit him. Um, sorry, I, that one is actually hard. I really would love to visit my dad and I I would love to do it and feel safe and feel not scared um, or feel like if I did get it, there was a very good chance I wouldn't get very sick and I don't have, like I talked about, I just don't have that assurance right now. So it's, it's hard. She's been medically eligible for Evusheld for months, and even though she needs it, she hasn't been able to get it. Her doctor is in Los Angeles and can't get access. She was excited to hear San Diego County Medical Director, Dr. Seema Shah, recently putting out the call for treatment requests. There's definitely increasing demand, but not at, which, at the rate at which we would like to see it. And that's really why getting that message out there to that if you're immune compromised, talk to your doctor, get refer, you know, get your Evusheld. Wait, it's available? She tried to get Evusheld locally at UC San Diego Health, but was disappointed to find out that they and other hospitals are reserving doses for their patients. She could become one, but that would mean starting a new care plan with a new doctor. San Diego County officials control the local distribution for Evusheld. The bulk of doses are going to major hospital systems like UCSD Health, Kaiser, and Scripps. Other systems have limited supply. Healthcare in San Diego is, is a little bit siloed, and there's the four or five large systems, but also a lot of people in that have private physicians, and they're kind of lost here, and, and so we're happy to serve that role. Christian Ramers is Chief of Population Health at Family Health Centers of San Diego. It's one place that takes outside referrals for Evusheld. We've had people come down from large transplant centers in Los Angeles who, for whatever reason, cannot get it from their own system. Uh, and we've even had inquiries from out of state. The county is working to expand awareness about Evusheld, but the current system doesn't work for everyone. I actually found a um, infusion center in Oakland. The San Diego resident is not waiting around and is jumping on an opportunity to get the treatment up in Northern California. It's not her preferred option, but sees it as the only way to get the same protection that vaccinated people have. You know, the shot was free for everybody. I feel like the we should also make this really easily accessible for everybody that's immune deficient and needs it so that way they are protected and they have the same equal of a protection as a vaccinated person beside them. Federal data shows UC San Diego Health has access to the most doses of Evusheld. However, they aren't available to everyone who is immunocompromised. UCSD health officials say that they are working with the county to develop an open referral process, but that system isn't in place yet. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. Research at Salk Institute and UC San Diego could make it possible to treat diseases in the brain using ultrasound. KPBS science and technology reporter Thomas Fudge says it relies on treating the head much like a concert hall. Ultrasound is best known as a way to view a fetus in a mother's womb, but it also has shown potential to cure diseases like Parkinson's and epilepsy by delivering electric current to affected brain cells. Focusing ultrasound on one part of the brain can cause injury. So scientists at UCSD have created what they call a diffuser that manipulates the ultrasound wave and makes it resonate throughout the brain. UCSD researcher Aditya Vasan says they attach proteins to targeted brain cells to make them receptors of the treatment. We engineer cells to express these proteins. Um, and we also develop ultrasound transducers that are capable of delivering a uniform 
um, sound field into an enclosed cavity like the skull. That uniform sound field is just what you want in another enclosed cavity, a concert hall. Engineering professor James Friend, also of UCSD, says the mathematical foundation of their use of ultrasound comes from studies of concert hall acoustics. My contribution here was to produce a diffuser on the transducer, the sound source itself, so that you have no echoes of the sound within that concert hall of the skull. Attaching proteins to internal cells to attract ultrasound is called sonogenetics, and it was pioneered by Srikant Chalasani, a professor in molecular and neurobiology at the Salk Institute. Curing diseases with this approach has a ways to go, but Chalasani says research has already proven the potential that this non-invasive manipulation of cells has to affect many conditions. In cases of epilepsy, in depression, we know that manipulating certain circuits in the brain, certain cells in the brain, is critical to our ability to treat those conditions. He adds that pacemakers and other electric implants may soon be replaced by engineered cells and the wireless use of ultrasound. Thomas Fudge, KPBS News. It was a big day for us here at KPBS. Today we unveiled the name of our newly renovated building the Conrad Prebis Media Complex at Copley Center. The remodel cost $50 million and broke ground in November of 2020 during the pandemic, and it will be complete later this year. Elton John is adding 11 new shows to his farewell tour, including a stop right here in San Diego. Farewell Yellow Brick Road, the final tour in North America and Europe, will come to the U.S. in July. Elton John will play at Petco Park on November 9th. And he's added a third show at L.A.'s Dodger Stadium on November 17th. The farewell tour has been planned since 2018, but delayed several times because of COVID and injuries. Tickets go on sale on April 6th. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org. Thank you for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Good night. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. And by viewers like you. Thank you.